Well, welcome back to Finance Uncut. On today's episode, Evergrande to collapse the global economy. So about three weeks ago, I recorded this video, The Great Depression 2.0, which was all about uh, Evergrande uh, and what was happening with it. So this was about three weeks ago before any of the mainstream media even started talking about this. And I warned and I said uh, that we all need to keep a close eye on how this develops because this could have big ramifications. Uh, so in this video, it's going to be an update from this video um, because we've got a whole heap more information coming out about what's happening with the whole Evergrande situation. Evergrande's crisis highlights China's shortcomings. In this article, I'll put a link in the description below, but it is really one of the best articles that explains the whole situation. Uh, you know, the storm may have died down for now, uh, but it might just end up being a, uh, a typhoon. And even Goldman Sachs admits that they don't know how this Evergrande situation is going to be resolved. So coming in from the Wall Street Journal, China Evergrande loses support of Hong Kong tycoon amid debt crisis. A billionaire Joseph Lau's company says it plans to sell all its shares in the real estate developer. And I can confirm that he has already uh, reduced his exposure from 6.5% of Evergrande to 5.7%. So last week we saw Evergrande stock price rally. However, there's indications that uh, traders were selling into this stock gain. Um, now, initially it, it, it had gained because uh, the developer had negotiated interest payments on yuan notes that were coming due. Uh, however, there is a lot of dollar uh, coupons uh, due and, and so investors started selling. Um, very interesting to watch. And Evergrande dollar bondholders say they have yet to get interest paid, which was due last Thursday. And George makes a great point with this tweet. A global dollar shortage is essentially a dollar cash flow shortage, i.e. to service dollar denominated debt. How does a Chinese recession affect global demand and dollar velocity? Well, negatively. Uh, in George's honest opinion, he believes that the systemic risks are greater outside China than inside China. And I guess we're going to have to wait and see uh, if that is true or not. Coming in from Keith Zai, Chinese authorities are asking local governments to prepare for the potential downfall of China Evergrande Group, according to officials familiar with the discussions, signaling a reluctance to bail out the debt-saddled property developer while bracing for an economic and social fallout from the company's travails. The officials characterize the actions being ordered as getting ready for the possible storm or typhoon, saying that local level government agencies and state-owned enterprises have been instructed to step in only at the last minute should Evergrande fail to manage its affairs in, a, in an orderly fashion. Yeah, good luck with that. They said that local governments have been tasked with preventing unrest and mitigating the ripple effect on home buyers and the broader economy, for example, by limiting job losses Scenarios that have grown in likelihood as Evergrande situation has worsened. And I ask myself this question, is this that black swan event that Palantir are talking about why they bought physical gold? Or perhaps is there something uh, over the horizon that, that they see that uh, the rest of us don't? How does Evergrande conglomerate put China's housing system in danger of collapse? China's Evergrande conglomerate is on the brink of defaulting on its $300 billion in debt. A fire sale by the company could cause a real estate collapse in China. And uh, it's not just uh, the real estate. It's a knock-on effect. Uh, and it's a knock-on effect to, to the global economy as well. And what we have to look at is uh, China's repo market and, and you know, the collateral that is held over there. And Look, one of the best videos I recommend uh, watching is a video by George Gammon. Actually, what we'll do, we'll cut to a clip right now. 
First, I'd like to look at a pie chart going back to 2015 that shows the bonds outstanding by issuer. And this is in the interbank repo system they have in China. And the system is broken down into two segments, but that's really getting into the weeds. We'll save that for another video. So these charts, these pie charts are broken down by the bonds outstanding by issuer and then the collateral pool by issuer. So the collateral pool would give us a better idea of what was being used back in 2015. But I want to look at the left side here to point out the actual bonds that were outstanding. So we have Ministry of Finance and the People's Bank of China. This most likely is government debt. And I say most likely because it's, it's very difficult to research China. Uh, not only do I not speak Chinese, <laughs> but the, the information is very esoteric if you can even find it. So uh, we'll go ahead and assume that these are government bonds, which would also be backed up by the fine print. Interbank collateral is dominated by highly rated government, policy bank, and state-owned enterprise bonds. Okay, so... Going back to the outstanding debt, we see government debt, local debt, CDs, financial bonds. This is interesting. Initially, I thought these were mortgage-backed securities, but they're not. If we read this footnote, it says financial bonds include bank and broker bonds, but are predominantly 86% policy bank bonds. And I looked up what policy bank bonds mean and they were not mortgage-backed securities. We have enterprise bonds. Uh, that would be corporate debt, most likely. Medium-term note, corporate debt, commercial paper, corporate debt. Asset-backed securities, just like we had in the United States, but only 1% government agency. Um, again, here in the United States, that could be mortgage-backed securities because they're coming from Fannie and Freddie. In China, not too sure. Private placement, that's interesting. But then when we look at the collateral being used, then we see it is the government debt and then these financial bonds. That's the majority of it. And then we've got about 11% or so of corporate debt. But what's really interesting is when we fast forward to 2019. Here I have a chart of the boom in RMBS, residential mortgage-backed securities in China. So back in 2005, 2006, they were just testing the waters, so to speak, with these mortgage-backed securities. Then they went into the ice age, <laughs> the restart in recovery. But since 2016, these mortgage-backed securities have been booming. The products have developed rapidly. The issuance size in 2016 is basically comparable to that of CLO products or collateralized loan obligations. Residential mortgage-backed securities products have been the main product on the interbank securitization market since 2017. The reason I wanted to point this out and why it could be a canary in the coal mine is going back to 2015, they really didn't use mortgage-backed securities as far as I can tell in the repo market, but that most likely changed significantly in 2016 to 2021, when according to this article, the amount of mortgages securitized went parabolic. So you would also assume that the amount of mortgages or mortgage-backed securities being used in the repo market for collateral would also boom. But going back to the whiteboard example, I think it's safe to assume the counterparties involved in the repo transactions, those who are providing the cash, providing the liquidity, don't understand mortgage-backed securities as well as we understand them in the United States. Therefore, those providing the liquidity or the cash could be even more risk averse if there's a slight downturn in the real estate market, which would lead the banks that aren't owned by the government in a very difficult position, a similar position to Lehman Brothers in 2008. So that was a great clip from George explaining the collateral market in, in China and in particular the rise in uh, 
residential mortgage-backed securities over the last several years. And I'll put a link in the description below. I definitely recommend watching the whole video. It goes for about 50 minutes. So, you know, boil the kettle, make yourself a cuppa, uh, and really enjoy uh, George's take on the whole situation. Um, but, you know, like George, you could, you could even see it in that small clip. Uh, any of the data that comes out of China, you know, I've always, any data I've seen coming out of China, I've always read with a, with a grain of salt or I've taken it with a grain of salt. So, you know, definitely the data that I read, uh, I am very skeptical on uh, coming out of China. Uh, speaking of reading though, I want to highly recommend uh, uh, Denny uh, McMahon's book, uh, Denny McMahon, sorry, uh, China's Great Wall of Debt, Shadow Banks, Ghost Cities, Massive Loans, and the End of the Chinese Miracle. Uh, it, it, it's a really good book. Denny lived in China for many years. He speaks Mandarin. And you know this book is really well researched uh, about China's uh, shadow banks or non-bank sector, if you will. Uh, and also um, the scams that uh, happen in China. And, and speaking of scams, there's a big scam happening to American investors right now, or international investors, I should say, but uh, in particular in the US. And the US authorities are not, um, aren't really doing anything about it, in, in my opinion. But Kyle Bass has been talking about it a lot. Um, so let's just cut to a one minute clip uh, where um, you, you'll see what this scam is all about. Well, first, on variable interest entities, I think it's the most scandalously deceptive financial structure that I've seen in my over 40 years uh, in the business, so to speak, of looking at global finance. I mean, as you said, these are they own shares of contracts of shell corporations. Ninety five percent of Chinese listed companies are using this deceptive vehicle. The American people have no idea that for the most part, they don't own one single share in one Chinese company. They have no real minority shareholder rights. They have no legal recourse. These things can be swept away on a whim of the CCP. And so uh, that is something that the Gensler and the SEC is suggesting can somehow be reformed with more disclosure requirements. That's absolute nonsense. I mean, in my opinion, these things have to be eliminated immediately uh, because they, uh, they can't be reformed. So I highly recommend you guys read this article. It's on Mises.org by Austrian economist Daniel Lacayo. I'll put a link in the description below, but basically uh, he argues that the Evergrande uh, situation isn't a Lehman moment. It could actually be worse than that. And, and he goes in to talk about that uh, basically the debt bubble that they've got, uh, that, that China uh, themselves uh, need to create uh, 10 units of debt simply to generate one unit of GDP. So basically their economy is a Ponzi Ponzi scheme, a Ponzi economy, and, it, and it's collapsing, it's falling down. Uh, and he talks about Evergrande. Their problem is not liquidity. All the Keynesian uh, measures have been a applied, all the different liquidity injections, low interest rates, you know, government intervention, all that has been tried and failed because their problem isn't so much a liquidity problem, it's a solvency problem. And, uh, you know, I've argued in, in other videos uh, that, I don't believe China is going to become the next superpower. Uh, why? Well, their demographics, for one, they peaked in 2011 and go down forever. Uh, they've got terrible, terrible demographics. They've got a massive debt bubble. And ultimately, uh, communism always ends. Central planning always ends uh, in failure. And uh, yeah, but I'll put a link in the description. I highly recommend you guys read this article. And there's a little three minute video uh, from Daniel as well. So could China's economy already be collapsing even before this whole Evergrande situation exploded? Well, in this chart, China's nominal retail sales, you can see the pre-crisis six year trend. And obviously there's the big fall with the Cerveza sickness, but uh, that trend is not looking good, friends. Now, yes, take this data uh, with a grain of salt, but could there be big problems in China even before this Evergrande situation? Well, I'll leave the last word in this video to one of my good buddies.
And I think my buddy Tarek here says it well. As folks wait for news on whether or not Evergrande will blow up, arguably the greater issue is that an industry that drives 30% of Chinese GDP is being left to wither on the vine by Beijing. Meanwhile, smaller Chinese developers are imploding in the background every day. And that's the thing, the, the real estate market uh, drives 30% of the Chinese GDP. And Beijing, uh, look, they are trying to de-lever this speculative debt real estate bubble, if you want to call it that. Uh, yeah, like a lot of central planners, um, they believe that they are smarter than the free market uh, and that they are all powerful and all knowing. Uh, this is going to be interesting. As I said in the last video that I did three weeks ago, I keep an eye on this situation. And I'm saying the same thing now. Keep an eye on this situation. Is it the next Lehman Brothers? Maybe, maybe not. Um, probably not. Uh, however, there's going to be big, uh, I think, consequences for Australia and the global economy. Uh, you know, should Beijing uh, not handle this situation well, and, and this really spreads throughout uh, you know, the whole real estate market, property developers, real estate market, and then maybe the banking system. All right. Uh, anyway, what do you guys think? Love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you like this video, please hit that like button. Really do appreciate it. Uh, if you haven't yet subscribed, do so and hit that notification bell. Anyway, take care, guys, and I'll see you again on another episode of Finance Uncut.